Hello world, and welcome to Deep Thoughts with Dave. And I want my topic today to be autism and neuroplasticity. I've just been reading this amazing book that I really, really enjoy. Uh, that's just been a wealth of information, all these different stories. And I'm going to make a couple videos because it's just so packed full with um, all these case studies and interesting people who have had their lives changed as a result of it. Uh, so to begin with, the best place to start is to describe what is neuroplasticity? What is this thought? What is this theory? Uh, so first, to understand neuroplasticity, you need to understand the theory or way that the brain was viewed before this has started to develop. And that has been called the localizationalist theory. And localizationalists believe, or had believed, that the way the brain worked was that we have these very specific regions of the brain. You have, for example, a region of the brain that deals with our motor functions, our movement. You have a specific area of the brain that deals with your sight. All these different functions that we take for granted and we go about in our day to day, but they are localized. They are in one place. And this is then to mean that if you were to damage one of these areas, that the use of that particular ability or skill is gone from you forever. So if you got a stroke and it disrupts your ability to walk in that area of your brain, you're screwed. You can no longer walk. You'll never, ever get it back. The, the beauty, the excitement uh, surrounding neuroplasticity is that it is suggesting now with lots of good evidence and research that this is utter nonsense. It's not true. And the best phrase to link to this idea is that when people believed once that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Not true. An old dog can keep learning tricks with <laughs> tricks with this new understanding of the brain. And that is to say that if you damage an area of your brain, which is to begin with designed to deal with that particular function that you have. So if you damage the area of your brain that allows you to see, another area of your brain could learn to interpret signals and could see for you. And so if you have a stroke and you lose the ability to walk, to see, whatever it is, the amazingness of our brain and its neuroplastic ability, its ability to change and evolve to the changing world around us, is that you are not just lost once you lose that one region. So that's the best way to say the difference between localizationalism and neuroplasticity. Localizationalism nothing changes. Neuroplasticity, it changes all the damn time, depending on needs, stresses put on it, this and that. And so now, having given that little bit of background, I want to talk about autism. That was the point of this video, and autism as it relates to neuroplasticity. And so, when you were very, very young, this starts with children, that's how this starts. When you were young, and you were a child, surprise, <laughs> You're a young child. When you're quite young, I mean between the ages of zero to eight, they've noticed the characteristic in children of this age is that they have a heightened state of neuroplasticity. And this stands to reason. Because at that age, you are a blank slate. There's nothing there for you to be able to unconsciously learn things and to be an absolute sponge to the world is a huge, huge advantage to you because that amount of input is confusing nothing. You know, there's no person there that thinks, you know, I don't know how I feel about that because there's no person reflecting yet. It's just learning information. And then this leads to by what method would be most efficient or would offer the most input at that point when we are that young. And what they had discovered is that sound, sound is most primary to people, and this is what children are picking up on the most. And you can see this in relation to the speed at which they will learn new languages. So when a child is learning a new language, it seems almost miraculous the rate at which they do it when they're very, very young. You know, you can't believe when you look at an adult, just how, like, how come an adult has to work so damn hard and a kid can just be picking up language no problem it's because of this floodgates open state that your your brain is in where it's willing to change in every conceivable way as sound comes in 
a hyper state of absorption that you can learn language more quickly. And further evidence of this is that if you are teaching a child to be bilingual or trilingual when they're younger, that this works in a way that is completely separate to the way that we learn language when we're adults. And as opposed to having one language, when you first learn your language, it's in one area of your brain. And then when you're older, learning that new language actually gets put in a completely different place. When you learn in this heightened state when you're younger, it's all in the same library, held within the same localized zone. Not to say that couldn't change, but that's how it develops, where if you have two languages, three languages, doesn't matter how many, you could stuff as many as you want, that they will all be just in the same library, in the same area, as opposed to like myself, when you get a little older, and it goes to somewhere else. So when I want to access my Japanese library, I got to walk down this hallway in my brain and go over to it over there. And if I go to my English, I go over to my English over here. And it, it's not as easy, you know, where these kids were learning bilingually, it's all in the same area. So much quicker, much easier for them. And so to go on, this heightened state of absorption, they found only lasts so long in healthy children. Because as you start to develop a language, uh, you start to develop yourself, uh, you start to have less of a need for this rush of input towards you. Um, I should make one last note that sound is so important because it's so immediately interactable. Uh, if you think of touch, um, if you think of smell, there's only so much as a baby that you're learning when you smell things or if you touch things, you know, there's... A, you don't get that much. Touch, not that important. You're not moving around that much. Smell, well, good smells, bad smells. If you really cared that much about smells, you'd hate yourself. You're crapping all over the place, right? So just to make that further point about the importance of sound is that is where you're first learning. Um, now to continue. So what they've found is that, as I was saying, that when you get older, you have less of a need for this heightened state of input. And in a naturally developing child, what will happen is that rate at which you learn starts to recede. Um, and when I say learn, it's actually just rate of input. That rate of input decreases as your, your personality emerges and you start to reflect on your own. It is through your intention that you, you, become, you become able to learn as opposed to unconsciously learning when it's, when it's not even a choice, it just happens. In an autistic children, what they discovered was that during this period of time, they are being overloaded and where it recedes for other naturally developing children, this input level, for them, it does not. And what this means is that at a point where they're starting to kind of develop who they are inside, they're still getting bombarded by all this additional input and directly linked to sound. And then, this messes with a whole bunch of other aspects of the brain, you know, not to make this like a half hour long video, but basically the sound is most primary. So language is very difficult for them, but it extends beyond that into things. They become generally hypersensitive. And so things like loud music, that sound again, but sensation, touch becomes really, really disturbing to them where a lot of autistic children have a problem if they're their clothing tags touch them. And because of this rate of input, well, another characteristic of autistic children is they're, they're not able to reconcile this amped up interior world that they have to live with, with other people. It's almost as though they're preoccupied by the amount of input that they have coming into them. Because when this should have started to recede, it's not. And the human brain was not meant to continually learn at this hyper unconscious rate. And so, going into something more hopeful now, we've heard why is it that kids are more autistic? That's really interesting. So it relates to this not having shut down for them. And then all these other side effects as a result of this increased input what a, what scientists, what a particular doctor found was that in doing tests, in developing therapeutic methods, if you try and train our response to sound, if you make a particular effort, because neuroplasticity, you know, these people are out of whack, it didn't shut down, it doesn't mean that they're lost. 
And if you make a focused effort into tuning in their ability to understand sound, then it can start to diminish the negative effects that they're feeling in terms of sensory overload. And if you focus on sound, what I'm trying to say is that they'll start to rein in that over input. It seems to be that if you train, uh, if you train their interaction with sound, then it will shut down this part of their brain that is flooding them. And so they've come up with these really interesting games. It's called Fast for Word or something like that. I can't remember the exact description of it, but the basic model of the program just had really simple methods in a fun interactive format for kids where they could learn about sound and improve their ability to digest it. And so for example, one of the games that they would have would be, it was a simple understanding of a sound is increasing in volume or decreasing in volume. Just that simple. And what it would be is it starts going, it starts going, and then past a certain point, it starts to increase or decrease. And all the child has to do is click a button as soon as they recognize that it's going up or it's going down. And then you can imagine various other games that you might have where, say for example, in learning sounds like ba, da, ba, da, those sounds are incredibly similar, but for a child that's been overloaded, they're not good at interpreting them yet. And so they have, again, other games where they have to try and recognize what was the correct sound, what is being played. All these simple, simple games, and then, you know, a character might have been making the sound, then, you know, laughs and has some sort of positive response. You, um, a positive response to the success of their learning is incredibly important because there's chemicals in your brain. One is dopamine and the other is acetylcholine. I might not be saying that quite right. Dopamine gives you kind of like a happy, I know I should do this because I'm happy response. And then the acetylcholine is a further, your brain registers more subconsciously. This is a neural pathway that I should continue to develop. And when you give that happy response to whatever it is that they've done, then they'll become more invested in the game. And they found very quickly that the children involving themselves with this game were seeing incredible improvements in their social behavior and just, yeah, social behavior. That's the best way to describe it, that they could interact better with people and they were no longer so alienated and overloaded by their, their sensory input. And this started to combat, like I said, that point where it, the floodgates remained open, these exercises with sound started to slowly close them again and tune their brain back to the state that is more natural and where they can start to develop uh, more normally and without all these other disruptions. And so who knew just how important sound is, sound, this vibration, this simple thing can create autistic children but that with a simple game that you could you could save people from this disorder and I find incredibly fascinating because this method is not pharmaceutical it's therapeutic and it means that you can correct the problem understanding the root of it that you do not need to resort to, dr <laughs> to drugging everyone you know not saying uh, actually I won't go there you don't need to drug everybody. If you more understand the root of it, then you can you can really get at the problem. And so I think that's fascinating. Uh, I'll put the link to the book down below. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself. And I'll be making, you bet I'll be making more videos regarding some of the case studies that are in it because they're amazing. There's about three or four still on my mind, but I thought that this was just so incredible and it sunk in quite well to my brain that I thought I would share this one first. So, like I like to say, um, thanks for tripping with Dave. My contact is down below. I'll be making more of these. You bet your ass. Uh, if you like, um, like and subscribe, all that garbage. Um, and until we meet again, world, ciao for now.